Okay, Craig Knight, thanks so much for joining us today, um, talking all things hydrogen. Um, just give us some background, Craig, on your company and how Hyzon Motors came into being. Sure. Thanks, Sam. Uh, great pleasure to chat with you. Um, thanks for your enthusiasm about the, uh, the hydrogen energy transition. Um, yes. So, so Hyzon Motors is a new spin-off company. Uh, it's been spun out from a 17-year-old PEM fuel cell company called Horizon Fuel Cell Technologies. So we arrived at the name, you know, by kind of a collapsing hydrogen mobility powered by Horizon, if you like. So highs on. Yep. So our background is very much um, the technology and commercialization around PEM fuel cells. We had yep. this vision of doing some, you know, some wonderful things with PEM fuel cell technology because we felt it was a bit of an orphan technology uh, in the world going back 20 years when we started working on this. And we yes. felt that there would be commercialization opportunities um, along the, the journey towards big, meaningful impact, if you like. So we had mm -hmm. a, a strategy that was very clearly think big, start small. So we started on uh, commercializing small fuel cell systems and gained a lot of experience by launching and commercializing small air-cooled fuel cell systems, which are good for low power. But remembering yep. almost 20 years ago, there was very little hydrogen available um, for practical means. So we basically sold a hydrogen solution with every fuel cell. So we sold small electrolyzers, we sold metal hydride storage, we sold chemical hydride systems and we even sold um, reformer systems that went with fuel cells to make uh, hydrogen in situ from liquid fuels like methanol. However, yep. over time, as the world started to wake up to the potential for hydrogen uh, as a clean energy vector, um, then we started concentrating more on very high, power, you know, very high powered systems, powerful enough to power trucks, buses, this sort of thing. So... Yep. Having had some success in commercializing applications for the fuel cell powertrains in vehicles mm -hmm. uh, in Asia, quite some success. Uh, in 2019, mm -hmm. we deployed almost 400 vehicles between ourselves and our integration partners. Um, we deployed almost 400 vehicles just in 2019, powered by our fuel cells. And that's, that's a yep. lot by global standards. Yep. So we chose um, to accelerate the adoption of this technology globally in markets like Australia, the USA and Europe, we chose to accelerate the adoption of the technology by going downstream into the vehicles themselves. And the main mm -hmm. reason is that the big adoption kind of rate determining step on adoption is technology acceptance. It's no longer technology readiness, it's technology acceptance. And where do people perceive the risk to be in the technology? They perceive that to be in the fuel cell. That's our core capability, yep. the fuel cell. So it's natural for us to play this role of deploying these vehicles and kind of allaying that fear around the technology, uh, the technology being suitable and being capable for heavy vehicles. So that's been the journey. Yep, great. So, so, so just on that, um, tell us about your capabilities. What kind of volume um, are you going to be able to cope with um, globally, like as you... Grow. That's a good question uh, because the truck market's very large. <laughs> so um, at the moment, yeah. what we've done is we have uh, worked to standardise a manufacturing uh, system, uh, production lines and quality processes and all the rest of it, to support 10,000 heavy vehicle stacks per year. So right. that's, you know, that's, that's the number or, that we expect to deploy um, in the near to medium term out of our US facility. So we recently took over the former General Motors fuel cell facility in a place called Honey Oak. Is that New York? Near Rochester, yeah, yeah upstate New York, that's right. Yep. And that, that will be our global development centre for the vehicle applications and it's also the manufacturing location for the fuel cells themselves. And then we work yep. with manufacturing right. partners for for bringing in the other parts of the fuel cell system, such as the batteries, the electric motors and so on. So we work with, you know, the tier one global manufacturers in all those components. 
and we have a yep. manufacturing partner in the US market. And this yep. is uh, Fontaine Modifications. And this is a Berkshire Hathaway company with 20 manufacturing sites in the US. And our mm -hmm. capacity to put vehicles on the road comes from their installed capacity of these 20 factories. So we have a fair bit of capacity to deploy vehicles through that partnership. Yep. A group like yep. Fontaine Modifications sees Hoson Motors as kind of a savior in a way because their business is under great threat. So as the um, sale of diesel commercial vehicles comes under increasing scrutiny, increasing regulation and downright bans yep. in a lot of urban areas, um, this yep. is really threatening the, the businesses that, that rely on, on that technology. So um, we have a great relationship with Fontaine and we consider them a long-term partner and they are yep. a, fundamental, um, a fundamental part of our, our capability in getting a lot of vehicles into the market. Yeah, great. So just, just moving on um, to, from a customer perspective, um, you know, like if you're, if I'm like a fleet, like if I have say like um, 50, a hundred or I'm like a big company who, who wants to purchase from you, can you talk about that and also about infrastructure? Sure. Um, let's come back to the infrastructure question because that's one of the most important. Um, in terms yeah. of um, fleet adoption, um, we're targeting initially uh, European built um, class eight, as they call them in the US or what we typically just call in Australia, prime mover type trucks or you know yeah. heavy trucks that they can also be rigid beds, but they're usually prime movers. So this is for semi-trailers. Um, so we're yep. targeting that with European built uh, vehicles with all of the high standards of European in cab safety and so on. And these vehicles are actually uh, assembled and tested as fuel cell vehicles in our facility in the Netherlands. So we have at the moment a small scale uh, facility in the Netherlands, which is really for all the early stage market validation work. And we're currently equipping yep. a facility. Uh, not far from our from the first one with a capability to deploy 2,000 vehicles a year so that's in it you know that's that's obviously in addition to the US based manufacturing capacities yeah so those yep. vehicles would come to Australia as ADR compliant vehicles with a secondary um, compliance um, certification around the fuel cell system and they're available in Australia from late 2020, early 2021. And these vehicles are being offered now to fleet operators uh, in Australia. And we have some yeah. agreements that are reached, but we're not yet sharing publicly. There'll be some soon um, in Australia yeah. and New Zealand uh, for these kind of vehicles. Um, we're, yeah, also doing, we're also doing buses. So we offer city buses and coach buses as well at the moment. And mm -hmm. we are, we are um, getting ready to... Um, hopefully reach some agreements around a slightly smaller truck too, which is a, an 18 ton rigid truck, which is just a two axle truck. Um, that's another yep. category. And they're usually used for various logistic truck kind of applications, or they can be open beds with various, you know, various uh, yep. customized things on the back. Yeah. Great. All right. Like can we just move on. Hydrogen. To we didn't touch on hydrogen, the infrastructure question. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hydrogen infrastructure is fundamental to this making any sense at all. There is a little point in me offering a truck to somebody who is determined to yeah, decarbonize right. their fleet activities if we don't help them solve the hydrogen supply problem. So we have partnerships with several companies in waste to energy and waste to hydrogen technologies. Um, and these companies are able to provide hydrogen at really competitive uh, prices, which give fleet operators the chance to run their fleets uh, at a yeah. cost parity with diesel fleets. Now in the early stages, this is really important. This is very important. In the early stages, really we, we, we meet and beat the cost of kind of per mile driven type economics, but within two, three yeah. years, we'll be beating the total cost, uh, the total cost of ownership uh, on diesel vehicles, we believe. And this is based on all the partnerships in place and the work we're doing on specific hydrogen projects, that then supports specific fleets. Because in our view, the transition towards hydrogen as a key energy vector localizes a lot of systems. It localizes energy yeah. production. 
it, you, will lo you will have local sources of consumption around that hydrogen because the economics of moving hydrogen are not attractive, but the flexibility yeah, of making it. that's really important it, point. Yeah, but the flexibility of making it is very significant. You can make it from all sorts of things. So if you're in an area yeah. that happens to have really cheap solar, you can make affordable hydrogen. If you have access to geothermal that, ha that has no load overnight, the, the stuff is free. The power is free. If you yeah. have access to surplus hydropower, like in Tasmania, the, the hydrogen can be very cheap. So depending what the yeah. local scenario is, what your local resources are, then you can have competitive hydrogen production in your local scenario based on the best match of resources to your, you know, to, to your situation. And yeah. it's, it's, very much um, also within our remit to bring localized manufacturing because building fuel cell electric vehicles is not like building a traditional vehicle and you don't need to make a million engines a year to be competitive to build a fuel cell vehicle. Um, you can build, you know, a few thousand vehicles a year and have a quite a competitive assembly process. So it's very different because you go from a combustion engine that has well over 150 different metal parts lots of them moving and lots of lubricants. Yep. On. You go to a fuel cell stack, it's a four engine, which has got like five static materials with no moving parts. It's a very different yep. beast. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. So we, uh, did you want to talk about like Recarbon or like have yeah, Recarbon is one of the companies that? that I had mentioned to you previously. So it's one of the companies yep. um, with good innovative technology. Um, this is a group that's active in Canada, the U S uh, Korea and Australia. And we're working with them to validate um, fuel sources, essentially. They can convert all kinds of different feedstock into clean hydrogen, um, capturing the carbon in the process. Uh, so this is a carbon negative means of providing fuel, if you like. This is really attractive to, yeah. to fleet operators. And, we, talked, and yeah. we have partnerships with other companies such as Raven SR in, in the US as well, based in California. Um, these these yeah. companies have you know, similar approaches. All these relationships are getting to the same end game, and that is affordable hydrogen, which helps fleet operators achieve really very realistic and competitive costs to operate their vehicles. Because it's our goal yeah. to have vehicles being deployed, zero emission, with zero operating compromises, and zero financial yeah. burden to the companies doing it. They, you know, they don't yeah. need to pay a huge premium to go zero emission as this stuff scales. Yeah. Uh, just while we're on that, um, Australia is really like building up like a lot of their hydrogen like production um, for export um, to like uh, countries like in Asia. So um, can you sort of tell us in terms of the infrastructure here in Australia, there are lots of demonstration plants like around like Australia like at the moment for like hydrogen. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like any, um, you know, um, national sort of strategy for infrastructure, that doesn't seem to be happening. I'm sure people like are talking about it, but can, can, can you shed any light on that for us, please? So, yeah, there's a lot of interest in, in the potential for hydrogen as an export. We believe that that's really helpful because it brings attention, brings feasibility studies, brings investment you know, potential and so on. We actually think that the highest value for the hydrogen, once you make it within Australia, is going to be dis to displace the fossil fuels that we're currently importing. So it makes little sense to me to yeah. be exporting a zero emission fuel to Asia and importing a fossil fuel that you burn with a horrible carbon footprint. In fact, that fossil fuel has a serious carbon footprint before you put it in your vehicle because it's gone as a... Yeah crude material to a refinery somewhere and from a refinery it's come to Australia in a ship and it has a horrible carbon yeah. footprint before you even burn it. So in our view, yeah. it is yeah. more sensible to displace fossil fuels locally with locally produced hydrogen. Yeah. And there are yeah, a sure. lot of fossil fuels burnt uh, in Australia and that requires a lot of hydrogen to, to decarbonize all of those systems. You think about every diesel vehicle running, you think about every petrol vehicle running, you think about any stationary generation generators that are used in anything from construction to emergency backup power or whatever. All these things yeah. can be displaced with fuel cell technology once hydrogen is affordable. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And and maybe like we should leave on that, um, on this point, um, 
localized production. So where is that like affordable now? And how long do you think it's going to take uh, for the cost to come down? Like, it, like a lot of talk is saying like 10 years before like hydrogen is going to be um, at, a, at a parity with diesel. Can you yeah, sort of discuss that question. for us a bit? There's a lot of, um, you know, independent studies and all this sort of thing that, that point to fuel cell commercial vehicle adoption happening somewhere between 2025 and 2030 at scale. It's our yep. view that we are bringing that forward. So okay. we have the experience with vehicle fuel cell powertrains and integration thereof into vehicles. We have the experience to rapidly accelerate uptake. And it's our view that in the next two to three years with mm -hmm. increasing uptake on vehicles as hydrogen becomes more available through some of these projects that are underway on hydrogen production. We believe that yep. there'll be a very rapid uptake, <clears throat> excuse me, from around 2022, 23, there'll be a very rapid uptake and the 2030 goal will be irrelevant. Yeah, great. All right, well, let's leave it there, Craig. Thanks so much for um, chatting today and filling in on what Heisen's up to. And I really look forward to um, having a chat like in the future. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much, Sam. Cheers, mate. All right, cheers, brother.